<laughs> this is Leisha Holmes and I'm your host on the Recruiters Recruitment Podcast brought to you by Hoxo Media. And you, if you've just tuned in right at the start, you'll have heard this gorgeous giggle at the start from my fabulous guest who I know is going to be such a great guest for our channel and for our audience. So welcome to you today. This is Simi Rayat. Is that right? Have I said it right? Have I just, you've said it perfectly. Perfectly. And Simi and I have been connected through the most incredible tribe called Women Unleashed. We were connected in March 2020 by Amelia Sordell, and we've gone on to become this exceptional and very authentic community of uh, business leaders, for females in power. And we've had a few offline uh, chats, haven't we? And I think the topic today is one for an absolute must for all recruitment leaders and those aspiring to progress their career. So for those who don't yet know your profile, Simi, you're obviously a corporate leadership coach and business psychologist, but tell us a little bit about what you actually do, what your day job is. Thank you, Leisha, for having me uh, on the show. Super excited to be part of the conversation today. Um, so my background is as a business psychologist. I've been um, in the industry now for 18 years. And I work with corporate leaders to really elevate leadership um, capability and help leaders attain leadership brilliance. So I work across uh, public and private sector organizations, focusing on areas like emotional intelligence, self-awareness, um, strategic ability, and being a lot more intentional and purposeful and playing towards our strengths. Um, so really excited to be here. Um, I've also uh, been a contributor for Forbes and have nice. written several articles um, around topics that I'm hugely passionate about. And uh, one of those is really leading from a place of values and being super clear on values. So hopefully we can touch upon some of that today as well. Without a shadow of a doubt, and for anyone who who wants to know why I've invited Simi on today, there you go. There is your testimony and your true brilliance in what you do. So, yeah, I mean, you've definitely touched on one of the things that we're going to talk about today, which is emotional intelligence. And I think it's something that as uh, recruitment business owners, we often muse about because we know that it's not just a logical process that we do as a job. But it doesn't matter whether you're recruiting chefs, whether you're recruiting, you know, software developers or recruiters, as I do. You know, our job is to understand the emotional side of why somebody's looking to move jobs why somebody's looking to hire and I think that the sort of notion of EQ has we've all had to become these you know experts and plagiarize jargon that you know we, we read and hear about but we don't actually really know what emotional intelligence is from a scientific point of view so can you give us a, a lay person's explanation and then it might allow our audience to understand where we're contextualizing this conversation have you lost have you lost the signal Lost you there, Alicia. Oh no! Right, okay, don't worry. Shannon will sort that out. Right, are you back? Is your signal gone. So yeah, I think um, it's really important to become clear in terms of what we mean by emotional intelligence because it can seem like a really kind of overly complicated um, topic. But to put it completely simply. Uh, people with high levels of emotional intelligence, they know what they're feeling, they know what their emotions mean, and they know how their emotions impact other people. So right. if we look at it in the very simplest ways, it's that ability to really uh, manage, uh, manage your own emotions, to own them, and to be able to channelize them, mm -hmm. and then thirdly, to be able to respond to other people's emotions. So that's mm -hmm. simply what emotional intelligence is. And there's quite a few skills, um, specific skills involved in developing emotional intelligence. But those are the three main um, kind of areas to focus on. OK, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because as you were saying that now, because we've not prepared this, I'm thinking, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's about being self-aware but also the impact your emotions then have on other people. Because you can affect, I can affect my emotions, but I can't necessarily affect how you respond to my emotions and what I my behaviours therefore are. So I think it's a really good place to start. So from a, you know, if we put it in context of the recruitment industry, you know, our job is to consult clients. It's to, you know, walk and talk people through their career paths you know, hopefully have people, you know, return to us and, you know, it's building those relationships. And I think that's where often it, that I think, you know, recruitment people or recruitment leaders, I should say, we focus an awful lot on the, 
uh, the scientific side. So what you build, how do you know what, how do you get your candidates? How do you get you? But actually the emotional side often gets forgotten about. So if we think about the recruitment industry as a meritocracy as well, where we often mm -hmm. promote, and I know this is a, you know your massive topic, the leadership sort of succession plan, that kind of thing. We look at what somebody's billing, but not necessarily in their behavior. So I think, you know, over to you in terms of, if we think about our audience, it's recruitment leaders and those aspiring to become leaders. How do we spot or how do we understand how that emotional intelligence can be portrayed you know how do we know which people have got high eq and which ones haven't is it something we can train and develop can you tr can you train and develop emotional intelligence it's a great question Alicia and I love that you've asked that question absolutely you can train and develop it it's not something that we're just born with it's you know the foundations that are set um and can be set from a very young age, but they can be nurtured and developed. And I think it's really important to, to note that when people have got high levels of intelligence, emotional intelligence, you can feel it. You can experience it. It's the way that they engage with you. Mm. And how, and what does that look like? It looks like um, in the way in which they are able to ask you questions that are relevant that are curious, that are coming from a place of curiosity to really seek to understand what is going on for you, being on the receiving end. But also it's that um, deeper level of empathy as well, being really kind of in tune with how others are feeling and what their situation is and seeing things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think as you quite rightly say as well, you know, as humans, we are all energy and energy is really contagious. So when we're around people that have got high levels of really positive energy, that gets passed on very, very quickly. Mm. And it has a ripple effect. But we also know when we're around other people that have you know, got that slightly more kind of negative um, disposition or highly stressed mm. and highly pressured and they let that pressure affect them and it then impacts how they are with other people that has a, a negative ripple effect on others. Mm. So it can come out in very many different ways. Yeah, mood hoovers. No one wants to be around mood hoovers, do they really? But, no, but no, the thing no, is no. as well, I mean, you know, I think if as we record this now, we are gently being eased out of lockdown. Um, and when this gets broadcast, we will hopefully fully be out of lockdown. Um, so we're definitely in a, in a good place, I hope, as a, as, a, as a country and as human beings again. But if we think about the last 12 months where we've, particularly in the Northwest, pretty much been in lockdown uh, and we've been isolated from other people around us, I think that's possibly where our own awareness of our emotional intelligence has been challenged. Because I know for myself, I'm, I, you know, I like being around other people. I'm very sociable and it has I, I, you know, have felt sort of elements of anxiety of coming back out and speaking to people again, but I realized that I buzz off people's energy. And it's almost like when I, the first time I went into the office, it was like I'd taken some kind of amphetamine because I was so excited by all this energy around me. So I think it's, you know, I think it's important to have that blend of people, you know, having people around you. So you, you mentioned at the start of that answer that it is something that can get trained and developed. So does that participant or that person need to participate? Or is it if, if a leader is thinking, they're my top biller, you know, they're billing, you know, four, five hundred, six hundred grand a year. I want them to become this benchmark. I want to elevate them. But they're they're at, they're selfish. You know, they're the they're, they're the bandit. They're causing all the problems. They don't necessarily want to change those behaviors. Can a leader change that person without them knowing about it? I think there's an opportunity to for anyone to change, absolutely. Um, but I think it's got to come from a place of, if it's going to be lasting change mm. and it's going to be sustainable change, it's got to come from a place of self-awareness, okay. of getting you know, a baseline, having an, an understanding and a baseline of, of where you are. Yes, you may be a top filler and um, you know, hitting your targets and, um, you know, doing so well successfully and being successful but also that can come to a, a limit as well mm. if you're not able to really kind of tune and fine tune those emotional intelligence skills yeah. it can have a limit mm. but 
at the same time, if you can embrace it in a way that really gets you to understand what emotional intelligence, like the value that it will bring to your relationship. Mm. And I think it's really, really key. Mm. Um, and perhaps top billers don't maybe necessarily directly relate um, to the importance of emotional intelligence in what they're already doing. Mm. But for them to be as successful as they're being, they're obviously applying I was just about to say, yeah, by by the very notion of the fact that they've, you know, they're they're achieving this level of relationship with their customers, they must be able to, you know, read behaviours and be instinctive and, and, you know, have all those elements that you talked about. So that's really interesting. So, yeah. And also because it's... Sorry, go on. I was... I was just going to add, Alicia, that also I think it's so important because as a biller, you are not just building a relationship with a hiring manager. Mm. You're building that relationship with the wider organisation, aren't you, to really understand the talent that's required for that organisation for the near future and for the longer term future. And to develop that trusted partnership, there's got to be a really kind of solid, transparent, open well kind of connected and um a a well-informed relationship that's Mm. got to develop between the hiring manager and the recruiter Mm. and then also the recruiter with the candidate Mm. it's really about understanding as well what's in it for each of the candidates what's really important to them Mm. it's not always just about salary no you know as we know it's you know it could be a, a whole raft of reasons why certain individuals want to either work for a certain organization or take up a a certain opportunity so as a recruiter to really kind of delving deeper to get a clearer understanding of what's really in it for this candidate I want to know and I want to understand because that understanding and that information and that insight is going to really help me ensure that I've got a, a great opportunity that aligns well to their values, their needs, their experiences, and their abilities. So I think the the psychology that underpins how top billers work is is absolutely at the core of what they do. They may not essentially recognize that straight away, Mm. but absolutely it's at the core of it. They've not necessarily taken a step back to actually think about how they do it. It might be, I'm not saying mechanical in a negative way, but it's it's become such a natural behavior to them. I think surmising what you just said there, I think there's one word that jumps out and that's trust. And I think that if you if you build trust, if you think about any of your relationships in your personal or professional life where you genuinely trust that person, it's because they, yeah, yeah. they match your values generally. You know, even if you don't do the same job, you, you've got a similar mindset and you do what you say you're going to do. And I think it's actually Absolutely. quite simple, isn't it? So it's it's doing all those things. Yeah. So I think going back to what you're saying about sort of the training element, you know, I, yeah. we're both parents, you know, it's it, if you say you're going to do this, I need you to go and do it. So it starts at a very early age. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, Francis Frey um, is a, a professor who's done some great research around the, tr- uh, around the trust model. And she came oh. up with a trust model, which is a triangle. Okay. And she says to really kind of establish and build trust leaders need to be able to be kind of well balanced on this triangle okay and the three points of that triangle the top part is authenticity so as a leader people have got to believe that Mm -hmm. you they've got to believe what you're saying Mm. we all have what you know I call a bs meter we can recognize when someone's pulling the wool over our eyes we feel it we can really kind of capture onto that so that authenticity piece is really really key then the next piece is logic the next point of that triangle we've got to be able to talk logic and share something in a meaningful way to our audience so they can understand it logically it's got to make sense and then thirdly it's about that empathy Mm. individuals have got to feel well does this person really get it from my perspective do they understand what's important to me yeah, And what ha- often happens is um, leaders quite often overcompensate on the logic side. They focus so much on conveying the logic, getting their story right, um, communicating really kind of to the logical side of the brain. But what happens is trust isn't 
formed in that no. way. It's right. really keenly formed when the triangle is a lot more well balanced. Yeah, you can't um, have one without the, the other. You, you can't have a disparity. Exactly. Mm, it's very that's really I mean we'll definitely share that as a vid- visual because I think that's so simple for people to remember and eat in equal yeah. measures you know you can't yeah, be logical without absolutely. being authentic and, and the empathy I think that's something that most people have had to sort of develop and show more uh, willingly in the in the last yeah. 12 months than they probably would have done previously I think that's really fascinating and, and make sure we'll make sure we we tag the right person as well the, the professor that's incredible yeah Francis Ray now you have you have supported and coached leaders all around the world. So is there a very open question here? But I'm guessing I'm leading you here. Are, is there a certain type of emotional intelligence that you think leaders typically possess? Is there a certain quality or certain? Well, I think um, I think the three components that I mentioned earlier in terms of the self awareness, yeah. so knowing your own emotions knowing how to regulate those emotions and then being able to manage your impact on others yeah. is really, really key. Yeah. And I think those three, quite often as leaders, when I've worked with leaders um, all different levels, we'll often find that some leaders are strong in maybe one or two of those areas and may need to fine tune or further develop the third area. And it can be different for every individual. But that insight is really important to first get an understanding honestly and more kind of reflectively of where the individual is on those three dimensions. Yeah. And once we've got that understanding, and I often use um, an emotional intel- intelligence diagnostic, psychometric, okay. to gather those insights. And then we work on developing the, the areas that perhaps they can refine and um, kind of master more effectively and you know a lot of people think that they're really great you know at showing empathy and when you talk to people really you know what do you do to demonstrate empathy quite often they think oh you know it's just being able to reassure people and you know make them feel that you understand their situation that's definitely a component of it but really it's about being curious and asking mm-hmm. the question yeah and simply just pausing yeah simply pausing to just create that space to digest everything they're saying mm. and to listen and I think, non-judgmentally I think that's the key when yeah. it comes to empathy that we're as human beings we try to relate everything back to ourselves it's just a normal natural reaction but actually to, that that's not empathy yeah. that's sympathy and I think Correct. it's really important to just really, I think very often recruiters, we're always, you know, we're always on the go, which we are. We're high energy people generally. I mean, very, yeah. very generic here. And I think sometimes if somebody's opening up to you, which I think people are more inclined to do post pandemic because we've all shared a human experience. Don't start saying, oh yeah, this is what happened to me. It's what, why, why is that important to you? How, how did it make you feel? And let the person listen. So I think empathy is one of the most undervalued aspects of what we do as recruiters if we're keeping it in terms of, of recruitment than than anything else actually I think they were and they were great questions that you just mentioned there Leisha in terms of you know why is that important to you mm. um you know what would this mean to you those are you know can be really powerful questions to gain some really good insight and I think also for recruiters you know high energy you know lots of pressure um dealing with also things that are out of control out of their Mm, control yeah quite often that placement (laughs) you know there's so many external variables that just impact the outcome Mm. and I think being able to you know have that develop that resilience and self-regulate emotions is hugely important and you know as adults not all of us are great at being able to identify what we're feeling, no. becoming really clear on what it is, what we're feeling, what triggered that for us, and then being able to then deal with that emotion and regulate it. Mm. So I think there's some really key skills that um, can help with, um, with those resilience and re- self-regulation. And I think the other thing is to look at it from a perspective of when things are out of your control, 
um, it's looking at, well, what is in my control? Mm. And, you know, when I've got a winning, when I'm in my winning mindset, how would I be approaching this situation? How would I be looking at it? And I think when we reappraise and cognitively reappraise the situation, it can be really helpful to have more of a balanced perspective mm. and outlook on the outcome and not personalizing it so much. Which I think, you know, and I, again, it is, I'm not, not being disparaging. Obviously, I'm a, one of the biggest champions of the recruitment sector, but I think there has been a tendency to focus in on the recruiter's gain and that's where there's you know that you you will find snide remarks about recruiters generally but that's where I think if you don't get driven by the monetary reward and you think about the actual journey you're taking your customer on whether that's your client or your candidate that should be your motivator as the recruiter that should be your satisfaction and you know I think that's where it's not it's never about us it shouldn't be about us and I often have feedback you know people thanking me which is wonderful and they'll say god you've been amazing and I'll go well you know this is my job this is why I do it to take Mm. you on that journey it's interesting that you know everything that you've said there really reassures me because you know I think one of the biggest supposed threats to the recruitment industry has always and probably will continue to be AI and technology but everything that you've said there is human interaction and is why recruitment will continue to be this multi-billion pound sector because we are as human beings probably even more so as we become a technologically driven world we will seek out that human element and people that make us feel like we matter i i absolutely agree with you there and i think the technology will just be a mobilizer Mm. um and it will enable things to happen but the human connection that that need that human need is so strong you know we've all experienced it in the pandemic um you know being isolated um you know working from home for long periods of time that disconnect even the ones that are you know so introverted there comes a point where introverted people also want that connection and need that drive and connection in different forms and different ways so I think yeah it's absolutely hugely important and I think also um you know just taking on board that with you know with billers with the recruitment industry it's recognizing that when we question well what is really important to me here what do I really value what are my values what are the things that are non-negotiable for me and when we become clear on those and we allow ourselves to operate in that way it's just as you said the outcome isn't what we're chasing then no. we're chasing and enjoying the journey the journey yeah. regardless of what the outcome is it's a bit like life <clears throat> I, and and you know to take it out of a work context I often people often comment and say you just look really content and really joyful and it's like because I do I seek joy every day even if it's in my beautiful coffee if it's in a nice walk, listening to a great podcast, you know, I think it's stop thinking about the longer term. Just think, what can I achieve from that? What's my value? I love that about getting your values right. I think, again, it can be something that's really dwelled upon. Yeah. The purpose of it saying we've done our values, but actually, what does it actually mean? It's, th- this has just been so insightful to me. I can't even tell you. And to anyone that's listening, um, please connect to Simi, especially if you are a business who is looking at succession planning for your leaders. Um, I'd love to connect you to Simi because she is exceptional and all your posts are always so valuable and uh, you're just a joy to get to know you. You've been amazing. Thank you so much for joining oh, us on The Recruiters. You, you're welcome. It's been brilliant. Thank I've you. really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Welcome.